Good afternoon. That was a quick change. Uh, this is, I am another interloper. I, I'm a geographer, so I'm interested in space, just as the architects are, but in somewhat different ways. And I think you get a sense of that from this afternoon's presentation. So the, th the theme, as you see, is technology and empowerment, geographic information technologies. That's the lens through which I've come at these questions of technology and, and space. And by geographic techno information technologies, I'm using a relatively broad phrase to refer to all of those technologies historically and presently that undertake processes of representing geographic space, locating us in that space, and navigating our ways through that space, and as architects, I think, understand better than many social scientists, transforming the spaces in the process. So this is something which happened under colonialism with atlases, sectants, um, wayfinding what systems and, and ships, and is happening today with digital earth, cell phones, navigation systems, and so on. So this is the lens through which I, I'm going to be looking at these issues, and I'm going to pose three questions. This is the social scientist for you. And, and work through each of these in turn. First, technology's trajectories are always already bound up with unequal empowerment in and through geo historical context. So this is remembering that empowerment is a very broad process. It's simply about enhancing or reinforcing the social and political influence of particular socio-spatially positioned groups. Then I want to narrate something which we've already heard something about this, uh, quite a bit about this afternoon, the ways in which there's been a remarkable digit democratization also of geoinformation technology. In fact, we've seen several examples already. And then third, I raised the, the, this this ongoing, irresolvable question of, of, of the serious questions that remain about whether, where, under which conditions, and in which ways democratization entails what I'm going to call emancipation, which is a particular kind of empowerment that associated with empowering the disadvantaged, marginalized, and excluded. So let's take each of these propositions in turn and work them through the work that's recent work that's been done on, on, on geographic information technology. To try and think about this question of how trajectories into the future are always already bound up with unequal empowerment, I want us to remember that if we want to think differently about the future, that often forces us to think a little bit differently about the past, to imagine different kinds of trajectories than the one we're on now and understand how we've got stuck, if you like, on the technological trajectories that we have. There is this process of path dependence shift embedded in social context which many, many people have discussed. One way in which this has come up in the literature as I'm familiar with is, is, is through the idea of geographic information systems, which is a particular way of representing geographic space that has become quite hegemonic in, in fields um, not only like ge of geography and the so other social sciences, but in, in planning and, and design. Um, a technology which has taken a particular form, as, as we can see here, a layer-based form of superimposing different characteristics of places upon one another, combined with such three-dimensional um, processes as digital terrain modeling, generating what has come to be seen in the critical social science literature as a very particular representation of the world, one that is rooted in logical empiricism and, 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 and the epistemologies of, of the natural sciences, the idea of expertise being in the hands of science, and a kind of view from nowhere perspective on the world, a kind of an approach which treats space as largely Cartesian and out there and, and, and works these things through a Boolean logic. And so a lot of the way of thinking about progress within here is to think in terms of how one version of this software improves on another. So you go from ARC Info 3.0 to 4.0 to 5.0 and so on. But the thing to remember, of course, is that this is already embedded in a longer history of technological change, which has been shaped with the direction shaped by the social context in which this has emerged. So these technologies emerged starting in the 1970s in North America and Britain um, within a context of a certain kind of post-war social science, stressing social engineering and operations research, um, the demands of land use agencies, of, of the defense industry, of census agendas, academic research, private sector demands, and so on. But I invite us to, to 
put that itself in context. If this is the kind of path on which these technologies did emerge, and this is an oversimplification because as a couple of the speakers have pointed out this afternoon, there, one's always branching off, but nevertheless there are these path dependencies from which you're branching. To go back and remember alternative ways of thinking about geographic information technologies, which somehow have been set aside with this focus on this particular model of the geographic information system, and to try and disinter what it means to think about these things. So again, with, within this critical social science, critical geographic literature, there, there was much discussion of how a geographic information system might look differently if we didn't assume it was a quasi-scientific device for taking what are supposedly objective facts about the world and displaying them in, in supposedly scientific manners. Ways in which attend to other kinds of socio-spatial ontologies, for example, those in native communities about how space operates, um, and also approaches which, which look at the question of how regular people can go around and, 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 and create um, representations and disinter aspects of the space which scientific models haven't yet captured. So I proposed an idea in the mid, uh, as an idea, of, as a way of sort of provoking this in, in the mid-1990s, the notion of the internet as a different kind of geographic information system, one that's not based on, on uh, quote unquote, objective quantitative data and, and cartographic scientific principles of representation, but is a much looser approach, representing perhaps one of these kinds of alternative paths up here that I'm witnessing to. So this then brings us to what this, which is in fact what's happened. This is the remarkable democratization of geo information technology that we've experienced and that many people have touched on this afternoon, which has raised all kinds of new questions about who uses this information, who develops the technology, what kind of ways can the world be represented that are not necessarily picked up on the standard trajectory, what counts as valid and useful and relevant information, and what different kinds of futures of technology um, emerge out of this. A particular starting point into this within the geographic information system was what was known as public participation GIS, the idea that people in communities could come together around GIS systems and engage in participatory planning, often um, imagined as a kind of Habermasian project of emerging consensus within the community about how to plan. And a great deal of effort was put into developing technologies that were user-friendly enough and enabled multiple people to work on them simultaneously from different sites, including the, ma the major GIS firm Esri developing these kinds of technologies. We experimented with very early versions of this in Minneapolis, where we developed something that was called the Minneapolis Neighborhood in Environmental Inventory. It was an attempt to draw on the perspectives of people living in what is Minneapolis's poorest and, and most diverse uh, neighborhood to challenge them to represent the neighborhood in their terms rather than the terms that, 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 that we uh, academics might do so. So we went through a whole process of a selection of indicators um, consulting between the team members in the university, in the community, at the, the People of Phillips Neighborhood Organization, the Green Institute, which was an environmental institution that the neighborhood had generated, um, developing various kinds of, uh, of, of indicators of the environment, whereby the neighborhood stressed this should not just be about green environment, but should be about brown issues as well, social issues and going through a whole series of questions of what kind of indicators are appropriate, not only in terms of what was available in, uh, as sources of information and what was in some sense seen by everybody as reliable, but what was ethical. How did you want to represent the neighborhood? And there was a lot of pushback in this case from Phillips, which wanted to stress the very positive and creative things going on in there rather than the sense of this being a drug-ridden neighborhood of color, which is the representation that tended to be imposed from the outside. And out of this, we developed a series of maps, which we thought was a particularly um, sort of intuitive way of representing these issues so people can place themselves in the neighborhood and think about the various issues going on there with respect to the variables and fa factors that we should agree, we agreed should be represented. This was a very difficult process. Uh, it, uh, we went into this with a lot of idealism about working together. It turned out to be much harder. They, the great intent, sort of inclination in the neighborhood to think of us as the experts rather than them. And what was developed wasn't used as widely as we hoped, but it's an example of this kind of thing. 
But this is just early stuff, and, and, and as we've again heard this afternoon, the, the, there's just been the, this proliferation of ways in which the internet has become increasingly spatialized. Location-based services, um, Flickr, OpenStreetMap, which is a participatory mapping system in which anybody can go in and, and, and add to the map. Uh, the yellow arrow, which somebody mentioned earlier this afternoon, Ashley perhaps, um, Second Life, which is taking us in, 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 into the digital domain of, of worlds that we create and, and, and represent, and which, of course, reflect the life world in which we live. A kind of wikification, if you will, of geographic information systems, generating this sense of user-generated content, crowdsourcing, emotion, affect, opinion being just as important as, quote unquote, the data. And out of this, of course, comes a much more diverse and differentiated set of perspectives on, on how, what the world is and how it works that are in tension with the mainstream scientific approach. One term which has emerged very recently to describe this is the term neo-geography, and I've taken this image off the web as, an, as, as a way of illustrating the, the sort of the chaotic nature of neo-geography. It's this way of thinking about the web as a place where geography is being made all the time by everybody rather than something which is in the hallowed halls of a department such as, my, as myself. And out of this comes all kinds of challenges to the notion that there is any one hegemonic way of representing things, one set of data that matter, one perspective that matters, and trying to negotiate between different and often differently empowered perspectives on, on, on how to think about and act in the world in ways which engage across them rather than descend into a kind of relativist celebration of the multiple ways of representing the world. And this brings me to this third question. Um, and I really want to reflect on the degree to which this process of democratization is also always, uh, also already in bound up with, with, with a certain kind of emancipation. Certainly there is empowerment, there's always empowerment, but to what degree is it an empowerment of the disempowered? Another way of putting this is to ask how all embracing these seemingly promiscuous developments are in terms of picking up on all the different ways and perspectives on, on how we think about and act in and shape the world, and to what degree um, these do, can and do disrupt the empowerments that always already exist. So on the one hand, we can celebrate the democratization, the, the, the social networking, the crowdsourcing, the meaning creation, the ways in which expertise is decentered as people think of their cell phones and their Twitter accounts as, 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 as part of expressing the geography of the world. Yet at the same time, as we all know, these digital inequalities are quite persistent. They're always shifting, but the digital divide is every much as, bit as present as it always has been. Um, the web remains unequal with, with debates about, even within the web, about net neutrality and intranet versus internet, quite apart from the question of access. Not just access to the web, but access which is fast enough and sophisticated enough that allows you to participate, if you like, as an equal partner. There are also, as we've heard this morning, so I won't get into this any further, this issue of, of, of shifting notions of privacy, in particular, what we might think of geo-privacy. So the debates, for example, about whether, about whether street mapping uh, uh, by Google, is, is, um, street view map mapping, is in fact something to be countenanced, or, or whether, in Germ as in Germany, people should have the right to have their houses taken off the web, and many of the many other ways in which um, cartographic representations can, can focus on an individual in, in ways in which statistical data do not. What about this question of emancipation? Well, I think we need to be cautious not to equate the idea of, of all kinds of people having all kinds of opinions and able to express these and perform their identities through Twitter and, 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 and through their cell phones and through their, their various kinds of websites with the notion of, of emancipation often being about people coming together around shared projects to advance um, agendas which otherwise would be marginalized in the social situation. And so a, there is a real danger, it seems to me, that we think of democratization as all about celebrating the individual rather than about creating the means under which people can engage across their differences and come together and work on shared social projects which really can shift things around. The final point I really want to make on, on, on this is, is, to, is for us to remember that these kinds of changes are always occurring 
in, with, embedded within um, a particular relationships between civil society, the state, and the market, which change from place to place, shift over time. The ones we're in now, which where there's a strong emphasis on market logics and the notion of individual freedom, is one which then shapes how these things happen. So neo-geography becomes increasingly commodified as new grassroots initiatives are taken over by firms and turned into products on the basis of which they have to make a profit somehow or another. Ways in which surveillance and security, the state and civil society, have become increasingly part of this, not only um, the cell, the CCTV sites, these are the CCTV cameras in, in Vancouver, but also the way in which we want, want, want to geotag our kids or our, or our parents with, al without, with um, al Alzheimer's and, and try and um, judge where they're going and, 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 and surveil them. And, and then in terms of the relationship between um, the par private sector and the state, I leave you with the notion that the remarkable parallels between video games and, and, and the people who are flying drones out of North Dakota over Afghanistan, which is suggestive of what we might think of as a military entertainment complex. Thank you.